Всем благодарам, что си со нас во Сиака Кот. Може ли да ни кажеш, ти си израелец, еврейн, кои живе по-долго време на Адвору Дежавата, како ги, како добиваш информации, како активуваш ова ново настаната ситуација, која до сега не видена во историјата на Израел? Аймен контакт, констант контакт, с numerous израелиц, от медиа, от армии. Моя сестра е former general in the army. She was the chief of the strategic uh, ministry, Ministry of Strategic Affairs. My family is well connected with intelligence and uh, so on and so forth. I am also receiving information from people, normal people, regular people. So I have, I have a very good picture of what's happening, I think, even more than most citizens of Israel. Well, it's a... Uh, it's a very unusual uh, situation. To start with, Israel received multiple warnings and a lot of information that an event is going to happen, and including the date of the event. Um, there is this story about Egypt warning, that warning Israel that something is going to happen, something big is going to happen. That is a disputed story, but it seems that it's true, because uh, the Israeli Defense Forces confirmed that they had intelligence yesterday. Second thing, multiple people received WhatsApp messages from Hamas before the event, telling them on the last day of the holiday will be your black day. So <laughs> these messages were there. Additionally, Hamas released in the 10 days before the event, Hamas released videos showing fighters of Hamas training to attack kibbutzim. These videos were available online for 10 days. Similar videos were released in December last year. There was a lot of information. The, the, the failure of intelligence was not a failure in collecting information. It was a failure in evaluating information and believing the information. The Israelis thought that the Hamas were just showing off, trying to re-establish credibility and so on and so forth, and they ignored these warnings. And the overwhelming vast majority of the army was moved to the West Bank to guard the settlers, the settlements, during the holy days. Because it's typical for Palestinian activists and fighters and so on to attack settlers on the holy days. The vast majority of army was there. It took the army seven to nine hours to reach the border with Gaza from the West Bank because of the chaos and the, the mess on the, on the roads and so on and so forth. And um, that gave Hamas a window of about two to three hours at least to operate at will and without any intervention by any security forces except the police. There were some police there. Now, the operation of Hamas was not uh, an amazing genius operation like everyone is making it out to be. Hamas started by attacking Israel with 2,500 rockets overwhelming the Iron Dome protection. Israel has a system, anti-rocket system called Iron Dome. The Iron Dome is essentially 10 units, or the only 10 units of Iron Dome, and each unit contains 200 missiles. They are known as Tamir missiles. And so if you send more than 2,000, more than 1,800 missiles simultaneously, the rest of the missiles will fall. They will not be intercepted by Iron Dome because Iron Dome will have run out of its own missiles. And that's exactly what Hamas did. It attacked with 2,500, of which 700 fell because 1,800 1, were intercepted and 700 were not intercepted and they fell. That's number one. Hamas has at its disposal at least 60,000 rockets. There's another 150,000 rockets in the hands of Hezbollah, in the hands of the Syrian army, and other factions. Islamic Jihad has a few hundred rockets and so on. So Israel is facing about 200 to 250,000 rockets. These rockets were financed by Iran. Iran invested about $100 million in creating these rockets. These rockets are homemade. They're, very, they're tiny rockets, they're small, they're not clever rockets. You basically orient them and they fall somewhere. You know, these are homemade rockets. The Tamir rocket that intercepts these rockets costs 100 times more than these rockets. <laughs> so Israel will have to invest two, three billion dollars to take down these rockets. 
And this is uh, asymmetrical warfare. Yes, it's, there's no symmetry in the investment. In... So rockets were the opening salvo that created total chaos on the, on the roads, on the streets, prevented the Israeli defense forces from moving to Gaza from the West Bank. And it was a brilliant way to prevent any intervention. And then the operation itself was very, very basic. Very, I would say it's an operation of villagers and peasants. They went to the fence, they blew it up with explosives, or they drove heavy trucks into the fence, and they simply tore it physically. <laughs> and they did it on 70 locations, 70 locations. And then through the hole, they entered. And they entered on motorcycles, on bicycles, on, on small trucks, on, you know, they mounted machine guns, basic machine guns, on the truck. And they were faced only with some police and civilians. So of course they had success. But it wasn't an ingenious, amazing, giant operation. It was nothing, basically. If you're not faced with resistance, anything you do will be successful. Of course, Israel has the incentive to uh, to say that this operation was fantastic, was amazing, was, because what, what should Israel say? We were defeated by, by villagers? It's humiliating. Israel is heavily humiliated. The sense of safety and security is totally gone. Uh, that we were defeated by such low-level type of military activity. Hezbollah is a different story. Hezbollah is a serious fighting force. Hezbollah has well over 100,000 soldiers, the same as Israel. Israel has 100,000 soldiers. Hezbollah has a commando unit, commando units. They are known as uh, Radwan brigades and so on. And these commando units are about 8,000 people, e equal to Israel. Israel has 10,000 commandos. Hezbollah has 8,000 commandos. The commandos of Hezbollah are as good as the commandos of Israel. Hezbollah has all the infrastructure. They have artillery. They have serious, sophisticated rockets. They have Hezbollah is a serious threat. Had Israel been defeated by Hezbollah on the first day, it would have been easier to accept. But to be defeated by Hamas is really disgraceful. So I just explain, explain. There's a misevaluation of the misinterpretation of the intelligence, and all the forces were in the West Bank protecting the settlers. There is no question that there was a failure on the intelligence level, so some people in intelligence must pay the price. There is no question that there was a general atmosphere of the West Bank is much more important than Gaza, because the West Bank is our holy land of historical ancestry, like Kosovo in Serbia. Yeah? It's where we started as a nation, so the West Bank should, be, should have the majority of the, of the army forces, should be protected, should be... And so the orientation was for the West Bank. And Hamas was underestimated by the political um, echelon. Hamas, they thought of Hamas as a small-time organization that would be focused on making money and, and perhaps uh, renovating or refurbishing the economy of uh, Gaza, and above all, maintaining political power. That's, that's how they perceived Hamas. In a way, Netanyahu and the people around him they thought that the Hamas leadership is like them, because they are like that. They are focused on maintaining power. They are corrupt. Netanyahu is subject to, to criminal proceedings in a court. Several other ministers are subject to criminal proceedings. Some of them have been in jail. This is a crime gang. It's a kleptocracy. And they thought that Hamas is the same. They thought Hamas is exactly the same. They don't care about the Palestinians. They don't care about anything. They care about maintaining the power. So they tried to bribe Hamas. They offered, for example, 60,000 permits and licenses for Gazans to work in, in Israel. They provide 75% of the electricity of Gaza. They provide well over 50% of the fuel of Gaza. They provide two-thirds of all the food that enters Gaza 
and more than two thirds of all the medication that enters Gaza. Israel was bribing Hamas, bribing, offering Hamas economic benefits and so on, just to stay in power. And they thought it would work. Israel made this mistake. Israel invented Hamas in 1987. Israel invented Hamas. Israel thought that it's good to establish a Palestinian organization that will oppose Fatah at the time, PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization. So they invented Hamas. Then another mistake Israel did, it introduced Hamas to Hezbollah. I'm kidding you not. The number of mistakes Israel made with Hamas is, is shocking. It's unbelievable because Israel underestimated exactly like the West, all the West. We all in the West underestimated the power of Islamism. America established Mujahideen and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. America established Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is an American invention. Hamas is an Israeli invention. We all thought that we could play with the Islamic card against other organizations. And so we didn't realize that Islamism is going to eat all of us alive. And this is what happened. Al-Qaeda attacked the United States and Hamas attacked us. There, there is a complete agreement between the far right in Israel and Hamas. They agree fully. I will tell you what they agree on. They agree that it's a zero-sum game. Only one nation will survive. The other must be killed, eradicated, eliminated. The far right in Israel thinks all the Palestinians should either die or become slaves. The Palestinians believe that all the Jews should be thrown into the sea. So they have a complete agreement that only one of the two people will survive. The other thing that the far right, the far right is in control, the far right is the government. Yeah? The other thing that the far right in Israel agrees with, uh, with Hamas is that civilians are legitimate targets. Both Hamas and the Israeli government believe that civilians are legitimate targets. Because the distinction between civilians and fighters in this region is artificial. It's good for Europe, maybe, but it's, it's bullshit in the United States, excuse me for the expression, in the Middle East. In the Middle East, every man, for example, who is now civilian, tomorrow becomes a fighter. Israel just Israel just announced mobilization of 360,000 civilian men who have become, within one day, army. So the reserves of Israel have been mobilized, 360,000 people. So are they civilian or are they, are they fighters? Similarly, Hamas. Hamas situated its warehouses, its munition dumps, its headquarters in mosques, in hospitals, in schools, in uh, residential buildings, Hamas, there's no Hamas and civilian. Hamas is within the civilian population. The civilian population also helps Hamas, of course, or collaborates with Hamas, uh, provides, for example, uh, uh, traffic, vehicles, provide food. For, it's, this distinction cannot be done. Similarly, in the Second World War, uh, United Kingdom bobbed, uh, bombed Dresden, Dresden. Dresden was a civilian city, totally civilian city. There were no military targets there. They wanted to destroy the spirit of the German people and the support for the Nazis. So they bombed Dresden. It was late in the war. It was not necessary at all. It was 1944. Tens of thousands died in Dresden. They used phosphorus and incendiary ammunition. That's the United Kingdom. After that, the United States bombed Hiroshima and totally unnecessarily Nagasaki. These were civilian targets. We live in an era of total war. Total war. There is no such thing as a civilian. No one accepts this when a war starts. Everyone is legitimate target. So there are calls within Israel, especially the extremists and the radicals and the right, the far right, and even the, not the far right, <laughs> I would say majority of the people, 
They want to eradicate, eliminate, flatten Gaza and kill as many people in Gaza as possible. I think Israel is making very unwise moves, many very unwise moves. I think it is reacting with panic, without any planning and, and so on. For example, Israel has now started operations within the West Bank against the Palestinians. They are arresting Palestinians, destroying buildings, attacking young Palestinian men in the West Bank. Why? Why are you trying to provoke the Palestinians in the West Bank to join the war? They were quiet. They were not doing anything. In these five days, they didn't do anything. Why are you provoking them? Similarly, Hezbollah bombarded, sent send a few rockets, I don't know, two rockets, to some stupid area called the Shaba Farms. The Shaba Farms are a tiny, tiny, I think one, one square kilometer area and the border between Syria and Lebanon. Syria says that it is Syrian, Lebanon says it's Lebanese, and it is controlled by the Israelis. So the Hezbollah, to show solidarity with Hamas, they send two stupid rockets to this totally empty area and another rocket to a base, an army base, that has been vacated, that is no longer in use more than 10 years, just there, just buildings. So clearly Hezbollah was trying to avoid confrontation. They were trying to avoid conflict. They could have bombed Haifa, they could have bombed, but they bombed highly specific targets to avoid conflict, just to show, yeah, we are with the Palestinians and so on. Israel reacted very powerfully, very strongly. Israel used helicopters and artillery and tanks and I don't know. <laughs> Israel is escalating on purpose the situation in the northern border with Hezbollah and in the West Bank. These are Israeli initiatives. I'm, I'm saying completely these are Israeli initiatives. I have no idea what the hell they're doing. I don't know why they are behaving this way. Uh, Israel cannot survive and will not survive. Um, an attack on five fronts. If Israel is attacked by the Hezbollah, by the population in the West Bank, by the Hamas in uh, Gaza, by the Arabs inside Israel, because there are a million Arabs inside Israel, they're all Palestinians. Should this happen, Israel will not survive. Period. Will not survive. This is suicidal behavior, unwise, and only intended to satisfy public opinion. We are strong, we are macho, we are this. Uh, wise politicians and statesmen don't behave this way. You know, the attack by the Hamas was an opportunity. In 1973, Israel was surprised by an attack. Egyptian army, Syrian army, and some Iraqi units attacked Israel, and then Jordan, a few Jordan units, attacked Israel by surprise. It was a holy day, the army was not mobilized, and they succeeded to enter Israel very deeply. After this, after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, as it is called, Israel was able to make peace. They made peace with Egypt in 1977, they made peace with Jordan later. This was an opportunity, the defeat of Israel, the initial defeat, because after that Israel defeated all of them, but the initial defeat gave the Arabs back their sense of dignity, satisfied them. They felt they are no longer humiliated, they're no longer ashamed. At the Arab world and Muslims in general, they are very shame-oriented. Reputation, your reputation is, they are reputation-oriented. So if I humiliate you as an Arab or a Muslim, you would feel very vindictive, very, you would want kind of revenge. That's all they have, their name their reputation, their dignity, their respect. So, having defeated Israel in 1973, initially, they felt it's okay now. Our dignity is restored, we can make peace. And they made peace. Now, Hamas did a horrible thing. It's a terrorist act, no question about it. They decapitated babies. This is unforgivable. And it is definitely imitation of ISIS. They were imitating ISIS, clearly. They were carrying ISIS flags with them. So this is a different story than an attack by the army, by an army. And so it requires a different type of response. Israel is decapitating the leadership of Hamas. So the first uh, target of Israel is to, to decapitate the leadership of Hamas and of Islamic Jihad. And they're doing this. They've killed quite a few senior people by now, unfortunately with their families as well. 
the second target would be to destroy the physical infrastructure of uh, Hamas, warehouses, headquarters, and so on. The third target was, would be to delegitimize Hamas as a political force, as a governing body in, in Gaza, by torturing the Gaza population, so that the population says, look what Hamas did to us, look where they brought us, we will no longer ever vote for them. And I, I doubt this. Hamas, the reason Hamas enga uh, engaged in this operation at exactly this time, there were two reasons. The first one was a decline in popularity. In, 19, in 2021, there was uh, an enquête, there was an opinion poll in all the territories with all the Palestinians. And Hamas got 53% support. 53% of the Palestinian population supported Hamas. That was 2021, uh, compared to 17% for Fatah. Two years later, 2023, Hamas, the support for Hamas declined from 53% to 31%. It was total collapse in support for Hamas because Hamas failed to tackle um, economic issues, uh, to lift the Israeli siege, to get more Israeli permits for work in, in Israel and so on. So Hamas failed in the management, in, in governing. Hamas failed in governing. It had a great incentive to, to recast itself as the only organization who, who, which is fighting Israel militarily. So this was one reason for the operation. And the second reason, of course, was the imminent treaty between Israel and Saudi Arabia brokered by the United States. All these treaties, the Abrahamic uh, tr uh, treaties, which, uh, you know, uh, Bahrain and Morocco, and uh, none of them mentioned the Palestinians, none of them took care of Palestinian interests, none of them made any conditions connected to them. Arab countries were making peace with Israel, collaborating with Israel on joint projects, enhancing the Israeli economy, sharing intelligence with Israel, for example, Egypt, regularly sharing intelligence, even intelligence against Hamas, against the Palestinians. All of them were doing this at the expense of the Palestinians, as if the Palestinians don't exist, as if the, the Palestinian problem is solved, and they accepted that Israel is the dominant force there, and the Palestinians should remain second-class or sixth-class citizens. That's it. Not, through, not to state solution, no one state solution, no solution. The Arab world has given up on the Palestinians. But Saudi Arabia was a huge blow. Because don't forget, Hamas is an Islamic organization. The, the Hamas is an acronym, acronym, Harakatil Muqawamiyya al Islamiya, which means the um, Islamic resistance movement. It's Islamic, like Hezbollah, they are Islamic organization. Saudi Arabia is the keeper of Islam. Saudi Arabia is Islam. The two most holy places for Islam, Mecca and Medina, are in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia, the official name of Saudi Arabia, by the way, is keeper of the, keeper of the sacred places. For Saudi Arabia to make peace with Israel, that means Islam is making peace with Israel and Hamas could not accept it because Islam is Hamas, Islam is Hezbollah. It's in inconceivable that uh, Islam will make peace with Israel and therefore dis destroy the Palestinians completely. They will not even have any connection to the big Muslim body because all Muslims consider themselves one nation. It's called Ummah, the Ummah. So they're all members of one nation. It looked as if the entire Muslim world, as represented by Saudi Arabia, at least Sunnah Islam, yeah, entire Muslim world has sacrificed the Palestinians in its, in its attempt to make peace with Israel and to work with Israel and, and, and so on. Of course, Saudi Arabia has its own interests in doing this. Israel is Iran's enemy, and Iran is Saudi Arabia's enemy. They're fighting a proxy war in Yemen. So Saudi Arabia considered the possibility that it would act against Iran via Israel. Because Israel was threatening Iran militarily. Saudi Arabia was very happy with this. The United States was very happy with this. So 
uh, it was an alliance against Ir Iran. And of course, Hezbollah and Hamas are long arms of Iran. The minute Saudi Arabia announced that it's going to make a deal with Israel, a treaty with Israel, it was clear to everyone, everyone, that there's going to be a major response by Iran. Major. Of some kind. Hezbollah, Hamas, both. It was clear that Iran will respond somehow. Because it means circling of Iran. It means total siege, you know. You have Iraq, you have, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Israel. It's a major strategic defeat for Iran. And uh, this was the second reason, that they attacked exactly when they did. And so, also there is this misconception that Hamas is a military organization. The military side of Hamas is very small. Hamas has a total of about 10,000 people. people. 2,000 of these people were killed now in the operation. 2,000. Hamas also used 50% of its rockets. So, all the commando of Hamas is terminated, exterminated. All the, half of the rockets are used. All the infrastructure is destroyed. Hamas was committing suicide. Hamas knew that it is suicide. Hamas understood that this is it. But what was the alternative? The alternative was to be a slave of Israel without any support by any Arab country. So they went on a suicide mission. Hamas became a mass suicide bomber. But Hamas, the military army, is very small. The major operations of Hamas are uh, social welfare. Hamas provides social welfare to population. This is known as Dawa. Dawa is the army of Hamas that gives social welfare. And uh, political activity. Political activity, they won the elections in the territories. By the way, Hamas won the elections in all the Palestinian territories. One, one myth, one fake news that Israel is spreading is that Hamas is popular only in Gaza. That is not true. Hamas won the elections in all the Palestinian populations. But ultimately, it was confined by Israel to Gaza, where it controls Gaza. And Fatah remained in control of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. But the Palestinian Authority uh, is widely perceived by the Palestinians as a traitor. Because Palestinian Authority is in close collaboration with Israel, including intelligence collaboration and police collaboration. And Palestinian Authority is dependent 100% on Israel. 100%. So it's perceived by now by most Palestinians as a long arm of Israel, a kind of puppet puppet government. Also, people misunderstand what is Gaza. Gaza is tiny, tiny. The, the border between Gaza and Israel is 47 kilometers. That's all. And Gaza is a tiny strip, very small strip, I don't know, like Skopje up to Katlanovo, something like this, in which 2.1 or maybe 2.4, no one knows, million people live. It is the most densely populated area in the world. And these people have two exits. They have one exit to Israel called Erez, and they have another exit to Egypt called Rafah, period. Both exits are now closed. The people in Gaza are trapped completely. They cannot live. They cannot also live by the sea. They have beaches, beautiful beaches. They cannot live by the sea. They have a port. The port has been destroyed, and there is a nav naval blockade by the Israeli Navy. They are totally trapped within Gaza. And they have nowhere to go. It's not like Gaza is a, is a big uh, country and you can move from the bombardment area to another area. Everything is under fire and everything is, is so. This is the situation there. <laughs> Ultimately, Israel, I think, I think what Israel, I think what Israel is trying to do, it is trying to flatten, completely flatten parts of Gaza, especially, for example, the luxury neighborhoods of Gaza, the areas where the Hamas leaders were living, and so on and so forth, they are going to flatten these. I think Israel is going to enter Gaza, but I don't think Israel is going to conquer Gaza. I think it's going to, they're going to enter a little and go back. Israel needs to do this to satisfy public opinion at home. There is no military need to enter Gaza. But there is a need for public relations to show the world and to show the Israelis 
that we are still in control. We are still the biggest military power. We still do what we want. We still conquer and, and we still can... So I think they're going to enter Gaza up to a point. They're going to stay there for a while. They're going to clear Hamas fighters, kill them. And they're going to destroy warehouses and headquarters and I don't know what. And then they're going to withdraw. I don't see Israel conquering the whole of the Gaza Strip. I, this would be complete suicide for Israeli soldiers and, and so on. This is stage one. Stage two depends cr crucially on whether Iran joins the fight openly. Whether, for example, Iran encourages Hezbollah and Syria, Syria also, to attack Israel. Don't forget, Syria and Hezbollah, the Syrian regime, Bashar al-Assad and Hezbollah are allies. They work together. Hezbollah supported Bashar al-Assad against the resistance. Bashar al-Assad is Alawi. Alawi is Shia Islam. His, uh, Iran is the center of Shia Islam. Many of the leaders of Hezbollah studied in Najaf, which is in Iran. So the critical question now, and this is why Biden, why Biden said, I warned Iran not to enter. The critical question is, will Iran enter? If Iran enters by encouraging Hezbollah, by encouraging the Syrian regime to open additional fronts against Israel, then this war will be a very long one and a very difficult one for Israel, in my view. I don't think there will be a clear victory at all. I think there will be mass civilian casualties and enormous losses to the army, to the Israeli army. Israel is in bad shape in any case. Whatever happens, Israel is in bad shape. But should Hezbollah in Syria join, it will be existential. There will be a question of existence, definitely. I, so this is if Iran enters. Iran, luckily, has, doesn't have many incentives to enter the war. Because Iran is reintegrating with the world. Iran joined BRICS. Joined BRICS, you know, the famous uh, uh, economic club or economic bloc together with Russia and China, South Africa, and so on. Iran is now an official member of BRICS. Iran, Iran received $6 billion from the American uh, administration. Um, they released five American hostages, and they received $6 billion. Billion, not small amount. Uh, Iran is now negotiating with the Americans a new deal, a new nuclear deal for the control of uh, uranium enrichment. Iran is integrating gradually uh, into international bodies, reintegrating into international. For example, Iran rejoined the climate body of the United Nations. So Iran is pacifying itself and civilizing itself and re-entering the family of nations. I would find it very surprising if Iran sacrifices all this for the Palestinians. I, it's very, it would be very surprising for me. It would make a lot of noises, it will attack Israel, it will say, yeah, Israelis are animals and savages and, and so on. Of course, on religious grounds, Israel is a transgression against God. Because the Jews in Islam are, are considered, uh, they are, in, in Islam the Jews are called Ahlil Kitab, the people who wrote the book, uh, because they wrote the Bible. And their status in Islam is al Ahlil Dima. Uh, second-class citizens, almost servants. Ahl al-Dima are people who are not Muslims. They are never Muslims, Christians, Israel, uh, Jews. And they are protected by the Muslims, Muslim government. The Muslim government should protect the Ahl al-Dima. But Ahl al-Dima should never have a state, army. This is uh, transgression against God, not against Muslims, against God. It's against the order, natural order, that God imposed on humanity. So there is a religious obligation whenever Ahl al Dima transgress against God, they have a state. Well, it's a religious obligation to destroy them. That's why in Hezbollah charter, it says that it has three goals. Hezbollah. Hezbollah, by the, name, by the way, the name Hezbollah means party of God. And it was given to Hezbollah by uh, Khomeini. Khomeini gave them the name. Hezbollah uh, was established in 1982, Hamas in 1987. Not, not a big difference. Hamas used to be part of the Muslim Brotherhood, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. 
So Iran is in, in the 80s established these proxies everywhere. And in the charter of Hezbollah, it says that we have three goals. Goal number one, to drive the Israelis away from Lebanon. Goal number two, to liberate Lebanese territories held by Israel. Goal number three, to destroy the Jewish state. And to destroy the Jewish state owing to religious reasons. This has nothing to do with politics. This is to restore the godly order as it should be. Muslims, number one, and everyone else, Ahl al-Dima, second class citizens protected by the Muslims. This is in, and in Hamas uh, charter, in Hamas constitution. It's clearly stated that the main goal of Hamas is to destroy the Jewish state and there would be no compromise of any kind. So lately Hamas tried to be more pragmatic and they said, we are going to suspend, we're going to suspend the war against Israel we're going to declare something called Hudna. Hudna means uh, ceasefire. We're going to declare a ceasefire. And we, in the ceasefire, during the ceasefire, we're going to accept the existence of Israel and a two-state solution. Hamas announced this. But the next generations of Palestinians and Muslims will have the obligation to destroy the Jewish state. They have never given up on this. So it is, Netanyahu is right and Hamas is right. One of these two nations must survive and the other cannot survive. Israel is the size of New Jersey. It's a tiny piece of land and it's elongated. From the West Bank to the sea, there are 20 kilometers. 20. 10, hour, 10 minutes by car. This is Israel. There is no way to share this territory. And there is definitely no way to create a Palestinian state. How would you connect the West Bank, which is here, with Gaza, which is here? How would you connect? Tell me how to do this. You need to, uh, to cross from the West Bank to Gaza. So you need to divide Israel in two, in two parts. No Israeli will ever accept this. There's no way to establish a, two, a Palestinian state. It's utter delusion, nonsense. And there is no way to establish a single state with Arabs and Israelis, because in 2050, there will be more Palestinians than Israelis. Even now, if you add the Palestinians in the refugee camps in Lebanon and Jordan, there are already more Palestinians than Israelis. There are nine, almost 10 million Palestinians and 7 million Israelis. So if you make a single state, within a few years, it will not be Jewish. A single state, if it is Jewish, is not democratic. Because if the single state is Jewish, the Jews will establish apartheid against the Palestinians. They will not allow them to vote, for example. So uh, if the single state is Jewish, it's not democratic. If it's democratic, it's not Jewish. It will become Arab. There is no solution because both sides, the Jews and the Palestinians, claim 100% of a territory. It's not like Kosovo and, and Serbia. The Albanians in Kosovo never claimed that they, they, ha, they, own, they own Belgrade, that Belgrade should belong to Albania. They, they never said this. Their claims were limited. The Palestinians are not saying this. Palestinians are saying Jerusalem is ours, Haifa is ours, Tel Aviv is ours, everything is ours because you took the land from us. It's our land that you built Tel Aviv on our land. That's your problem. You made a mistake. This is our land. So 100% of the territory of Israel is claimed by the Palestinians. And 100% of the territory of Israel now is claimed by most Israelis, not all, most, those on the right. You mean of Palestina? Of the territory yes. of Palestine, yes. yes. Should be Jewish, yes. Should be Jewish. And the same with the Palestinians. How do you solve this? No way to solve this. I'm sorry to say. All the solutions offered, offered are idiotic. Two state, one state. There is no solution here. One of these two people must go. Go. Now, the two sides have been trying ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing long before Serbia. <laughs> the two sides were trying ethnic cleansing. In 1948, the Jewish armies um, 
pushed away many Palestinian villages out of their villages, out of their towns, and conquered these villages and towns. Additionally, the Arab leadership at the time told the Palestinians to leave the territory and to go. So this created an enormous refugee problem. It's the oldest refugee problem in the world. The, the Palestinians call this event Nakba. Nakba means the enormous catastrophe. So. In 1948, there was a policy of ethnic cleansing by the Israeli armed forces, supported, ironically, by the Arab leadership, who told the, Arab, the Palestinians to leave. But this, was, this is being repeated. In the last 25 years, the Israelis are building settlements, huge number of settlements, tens of thousands of, of apartments and houses and, uh, a year, every year exactly within Arab population centers. So there is an Arab population center and the Israelis are surrounding it with settlements and settlers, isolating the Arab, Arabs. Finally, the Arabs leave. They run away because the settlers are violent very often. The settlers are cutting them off, not allowing them to work. So the Arabs of this settlement leave. So there is a slow motion ethnic cleansing taking place in the Palestinian territories. Similarly, of course, the Palestinians think that they should, they have perfect legitimate demand to kill the Jews. They think they should kill the Jews. In 1967, the slogan of the armies that attacked Israel was all the Jews to the sea. In all the official documents of all the Palestinian leadership of any kind, including Fatah, there are debates between intellectuals and debates between politicians what to do with the Jews after we conquer Palestine. So some of them say we should return them to Europe, where they came from. Some of them say, no, we should, those who were born in Palestine, they should remain and they should become second class citizens, Al al Dima, and we will protect them as an Islamic regime. Muslim regime. They are debating this. This is practical questions. This is not a, a dream. They have a plan, a program to throw away all the Jews. Those who were not born in Israel out and those who were born in Israel, second class citizens, under control. Both sides are trying to accomplish this goal of throwing out of the territory the other nation. Both the, the Jews and the Arabs. They're trying the same thing exactly. And, and it's not going to lead anywhere. The difference now, and I will try to be as brief as I can, the difference now is that in Israel, the divisions within the, the Israelis are now to the point of a civil war. And the event with Hamas, I think, once all is over, once you know, everything is quiet again, I think the event with Hamas will lead to another war, a civil war. I predict with high certainty the equivalent of a civil war within Israel between left and right, ultra-Orthodox Jews and non-religious Jews, secular Jews, and so on. I think Israel has reached the point that its population can no longer live in peace with each other. There is no consensus. There is no common ground. There is no common platform. There is no common vision of what Israel should be like and how it should behave. And it reached the point when Netanyahu tried to impose an effective dictatorship by weakening the Supreme Court. When he introduced criminals into the government, himself being a criminal, official, this is not just a label, he's officially charged with severe crimes in, in the courts. Now that a criminal gang has taken over, and is destroying the judicial system. We have seen demonstrations of one million people every weekend, every single weekend, for seven months. And now there is a big part of the Israeli population demanding to, for Netanyahu and all the others to resign and to put them on trial as traitors, as traitors. The demands are escalating within the Jewish public. Why do I think it will lead to a civil war? Because I have lived in Israel during four wars, four, I was there. At war, the Israelis unite. 
they never attack the politicians, they never argue, they never fight, they unite, they're one. This is the first war where Israelis are ignoring the war and attacking each other. The first time I see this, never happened before. This is the first time where Israelis don't care anymore about winning the war. They don't care about the army. They're disappointed with the army. They don't feel safe, they don't feel secure. They don't care about, uh, about the risk of fracturing Israel, weakening Israel when all the external enemies are attacking. They don't care anymore. They want revenge on the, poli on, on the politicians, revenge on the intelligence community, revenge on the army. It's as if Israelis have accepted that Israel will no longer be. I have never seen such phenomena before. This is the first time I've seen this. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome.